Uh, then our next section, I get to be a, a chat show host. Back in the 1970s, personal computing, before there was personal computers, uh, my first involvement was with a timesharing company called Comshare, where somebody had quite casually or accidentally installed an APL interpreter, Sigma APL, and another colleague showed me what it was like writing programs, and I immediately stopped wanting to write Fortran programs and wanted to do all my work in APL, despite having to type reshape as $RHO. Um, and I got to do my first solo project in APL. Over at a, one of our competitors, Atkins, an engineering company that run a timesharing service, uh, a man called John Scholes, had, a systems programmer, had installed uh, APL over there too, and Atkins was in the APL business. Sometime in 1976, a group of computer consultants broke away from Atkins to form a new company called Attic. One of those computer consultants is with us here this morning. Please welcome my first guest, Jeff Streeter. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show. Okay. <laughs> So you left Atkins to start up something called Diadic. What, what, how did that happen? What would you, what would you have in mind? There was a, a group of sort of APL guys um, at Atkins at the time, and somebody, I think a rank Xerox guy, decided he wanted to form a consultancy, and he put out an advert to come along to a particular hotel. And uh, a number of us went along and had a look at this. And what actually happened was Phil Gosher, who was my boss at the time, had turned up early for this meeting, persuaded this guy that he should be doing all the interviewing and such like. So we turned up and we wound up being interviewed by our boss. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Did you ask for a reference? <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't ask for a reference. <laughs> but following that, what happened was um, they went back and they said, oh, well, we've got all these people who are interested in this. All we need is a salesman. And then we can dump the original guy. So they contacted Ted Hare, who was one of Atkins' best salesmen. He came on board. The original guy had been cut out of the deal. And uh, five of us formed Dietic Systems. Um, I was the first one out on a contract, and that was Jan 31st, 77. So you were, unlike Atkins, you didn't have your own data center. You didn't have time-sharing revenues. Or an office. Or an office. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, perhaps one early instance of a virtual company. You could put it that way. <laughs> Always like to recognize pioneers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so your only revenues were from your consulting fees. Correct. Yeah. So how did that work out? Uh, incredibly well. The um, first contract I did was for Xerox Corp up on the Euston Road in London. And um, we were using a relational database written by a couple of guys from Xerox Corp in Rochester. And it, it was written in APL, and it performed like a dog. And they were using this for doing the whole of the sort of company reporting for the world. Um, that project sort of basically failed on the database performance. And I was working 11 hour days, build. <laughs> all the way through, and uh, once that project failed, what happened after that was I threw the relational database away and uh, built one designed on the forms that they were submitting, and with a very general reporting and uh, 
retrieval language that I sort of put on top of this. And that worked really well. And 20 years later, I still got the odd call from Xerox. <laughs> So you must have been doing. It was well. still working at that stage. You must have been doing very really well because, I mean, companies like uh, like Comshare and IP Sharp Associates, where we had the time sharing revenues, we tended to give away or dis heavily discount the consulting fees, the cost of developing the software, um, in order to get the time sh time sharing revenue. Uh -huh. uh, so you were. W working against very heavily, you're competing against very heavily discounted services uh, and you didn't have the time sharing revenues to sustain that, which of course are a lot more stable than uh, consulting revenues which can... Yep. Uh, yep. So how, how did that play? I don't know because I'm the techie guy. Right. <laughs> okay. But it, it ran and, for, and, for and a while. Phil, Phil and Ted were worrying about the, uh, <laughs> the economics. <laughs> so um, I stayed clear of most of the, uh, the, uh, the sort of financial side mm. of this and just stuck techie. And uh, there were a number of other consultants who were out. You know, David Crossley was doing consultancy. Um, John Stembridge was doing consultancy. Um, I think mainly at Rank Xerox, which is a separate company mm. from Xerox as part of the but sort of UK eventually side of the managers started to eye some of those time-sharing revenues and you wanted, and, and wanted to get into the business of providing an APL? I think John's got more um, input on that side of it, but um, we wanted uh, to spread the load a bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. to have another string to our bow. So, they, some, so a project was formed to write an APL? Yes. Yes. And, and that, was, that was when um, that, th that was when people remembered that John Scholes back at Atkins yep. had installed um, APL yep. um, and you went looking for someone to work with you yep. on developing a new APL. But we also knew that he had written the APL for ICL by then. So uh, we knew well, it was experienced in implementing APL. Let's have our second guest. Guest, <laughs> please welcome John Skull. <laughs> ah, so jo John, you've been working over at ICL, writing them an APL interpreter. Uh, as part uh, of that team, yes, yes. What did you hear? What happened? With the di with Dialic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, uh, the uh, ICL interpreter was a first generation interpreter, flat arrays, and <clears throat> it was a very traditional team, a big team, lots of admin, lots of memos, there were 14 of us, uh, <clears throat> spending most of our time writing memos between each other. Um, <clears throat> and then that, the um, a uh, plug was pulled on that project and we were given the opportunity of writing an APL for the very old-fashioned 1900 machine, uh, which none of us relished very much. So I was um, quite depressed at this point and uh, I had known David Crossley from Atkins and um, he hinted that they may have a project. Um, and I was very interested in this, so we, we got talking and I was invited to come along and join the project to write a, a new APL from scratch for a Unix mini computer. For a Unix mini computer? <coughs> yes. That was quite a notable decision to choose that platform. It, <coughs> it was, but I think it was an expedient. They, um, uh, the, one of the, uh, one of the players in Dyadic Systems was Pauline Brand, a very important uh, <coughs> member, and her sister happened to be the European sales director of Zilog Limited. And all the old guys will remember the Zilog Z80 uh, 8-bit machine. Um, and Zilog had just bought out a 16-bit machine, the Z8000. And um, 
in those days, the, uh, there, were, there were many, many more uh, computer companies, and they wanted a tick in the APL box. So if you went to buy one of their computers, you'd say, has it got Fortran? Has it got COBOL? Has it got a spreadsheet? Has it got APL? <clears throat> so all the companies just needed a tick. And the deal was that um, we they would provide us office space, two desks, and uh, access to machines, or a machine. I don't know how many machines. Was there just one in the office? Uh, yeah, we only used one. One. Um, in exchange for the tick in the box. Um, so, and the uh, company was Zilog, and we were dyadic, and we wondered what a good name for the product might be. Um, so we, somebody chose Dialog as an amalgam of those two names. So the name Dialog first appeared as the name of a product um, <coughs> produced by Dyadic Systems. Yes. yes. And Dyadic Systems in those days was about half a dozen, eight people. There's two sides to that, and I'm struggling to remember a name. We had a Midlands group hmm. uh, with a different name, and I don't remember the name of it. Ray might. But a small group of people but, doing uh, APL consulting. Under John Ward. So we were 10 or 15 people at that stage. <coughs> and they were supporting you and John in an office somewhere. Where were you working? In uh, Maidenhead in Berkshire. In Maidenhead, yeah, in on Berkshire. the River Thames in Berkshire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> they, they were supporting you with the consulting revenues while you wrote an APL interpreter. What were you expecting at this time? Did you, how long did you think you'd be working on this? Project was. Well, the budget, <clears throat> um, the budget was for I think loosely a, a year, twelve months to produce. When I joined, the, the project shifted. When I joined, it was going to be a first generation APL, mm. and the budget was for one year, uh, approximately, uh, to do two guys for one year to do a uh, um, a first generation APL. And that uh, I'm I'm slightly perturbed by that picture. <laughs> 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 Would you buy an APL from? Um, this was you. <laughs> this was me a hundred years ago. Yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. With hair. Um, so two two men one year. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this was 1970. Eight, 82. 81. 81. 81. 81. Okay. We started. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about that time, Arthur Whitney was just was about to write his first APL interpreter. Arthur's um, comments on things are notoriously terse. When I showed him this part of your story, um, he highlighted the two men, one year, and just said, that is fast. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah. But, um, that's high praise. I mean, that's, that's praise from the, from the master. I thought so. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but he would have expected high quality algorithms for the primitives. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's, talk, let's talk about quality. You mentioned a moment ago, this is a first generation APL, somewhere in the prospectus for dyadic, some of the business documents that um, there's a mention of a second generation mm -hmm. APL. What were you setting out to write? Um, what happened was there was a discussion about whether we should go for a second generation APL. And Bob Smith had published his blue book. Um, we looked at it. We thought, go for it. You know, <coughs> we're a couple of arrogant, fairly young at the time, <laughs> guys. And we, we went for it. And we basically picked up his blue book and pretty well implemented it. Um, which is more than STSC had done at the time. <laughs> and uh, that, that worked out quite well. We didn't, I didn't, personally, I didn't even know about APL2. It was under the wrap somewhere at IBM. And some of these guys on that side of the Atlantic may have known about what was going on because they could talk to the guys who were doing it. But we, hadn't, we had no idea. 
So there was a world over there, the Minnebrook conferences, the implementers mm -hmm. would get together. Roy Sykes was telling us earlier the close working relationships between the IP Sharp and the STSC implementers. Um, you were we, part of this? We were none of that. We, we, <laughs> the, this is going to shock some people here, but there was no internet. Can you imagine? <clears throat> there was no email. Um, and our access to documents was very restricted. Publication, um, it, it was a big deal. So we had, we had heard rumors that people were discussing second generation APLs. We knew there was a big debate uh, about grounded versus floating arrays. And the big players from our perception uh, were um, IP Sharp, um, uh, STSC and IBM, they were, <clears throat> they were the three players. And we knew that uh, Sharp favoured the grounded array system and we knew because we'd seen Bob's book that uh, uh, STSC favoured the floating system. But in a way that was irrelevant because whichever IBM picked would be the standard. And we had to bet the farm and, and um, uh, th th you know, this was, a, th this was people's income on choosing which way to jump. So it was not at all clear when we went from a first generation to a second generation which way we should go. And <clears throat> I think if we hadn't, if we'd had access to um, uh, sharp, equivalent sharp documentation, may maybe we, we would have gone that way, we don't know. But we chose, be because we had Bob's beautiful... Um, book where that would that it influenced us and fortunately IBM chose to follow Jeff and me in their <laughs> <coughs> in their design um, and came out with a with a, an implementation that wasn't too far away to the extent that people were able to, later on to port their APL2 systems to dialogue without too much problem. I'm sure the IBM users were very glad of the wisdom that IBM showed in following you. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I imagine myself as, as one of your colleagues in those days working the 11-hour days on billable projects um, and seeing you guys were working month after month on a project which was bringing in no billing, um, what kind of progress would I have seen? Should I, would I have worried? Yes. <laughs> well, Jeff, I have an a couple of anecdotes. Yeah. I'm sure Jeff does. No, well, I don't have a lot of anecdotes. We would go along. Uh, there was a monthly sort of company meeting that normally happened at one of the directors' houses uh, or whatever, and uh, we'd go along to the, those meetings and report on progress that we had made. Um, couldn't take along a Zyla big box. Can't demonstrate it. So uh, all we can do is say, you know, how far we progressed, which um, parts of the interpreter were there and were working. Um, and I don't recollect there being a lot of resistance at all. Mm. I think there was a lot of support for what we were doing. Mm. Um, I don't, you, you suggest that there's sort of some resentment going on there. I don't recollect any resentment. But I may be just being insensitive, <laughs> as my <laughs> wife puts it. <laughs> I, I think they were concerned because um, we were there sitting in an office having fun uh, yeah, writing programs. And I remember one of the first monthly, meet the monthly meetings, because the dialect systems didn't have a fixed office, we would meet at one of the director's houses for dinner once a month and everybody would report what they'd been doing. And when it came Jeff and my turn, um, people were very keen to know if this was going to succeed, this project, and if not, let's pull the plug early. If it is, let's see proof of it. And the first meeting we had, um, the only thing we had to show was a, a very slightly formatted hexadecimal dump of a, uh, on continuous stationary of a workspace. So we passed this around reverently to <laughs> the, uh, and it showed some of the heap, a hex dump of the heap. So I remember that. And the second time I remember, 
when we actually had enough to demonstrate, um, so you could type small expressions in, um, the, uh, some of the company members came along. And we had, because it was a second generation APL, for example, the reduction operator had to take any dyadic function, not just the scalar functions, but any dyadic function as an operand. So we had coded this initially as a ge the general case. And so it did, uh, as um, Roy had said, it, it fished out the first item, made it into a separate <coughs> little array on its own, fished out the next item, created another array, passed those to the dyadic function, passed it back. So I think the first time, um, I remember Peter Donnelly trying plus slash on a, a matrix, and he was horrified by the time it took. And, um, uh, you know, when we said, well, we haven't optimised it yet, he was probably rightly sceptical that uh, <laughs> that would ever come. So there was a lot. It was a tough project, and it kind of, I think, it hovered on the edge of viability from that time for the next... 20 years. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you were working in a world in which people wrote in APL interpreters for specific machines, and you were writing um, from the outset for the Zilog machine, mm -hmm. and the company had, I think, pressed you to use their own language. Yes. You know, PL PLZ PLZ sys. PLZ sys. PLZ slash yeah. sys, yeah. But you weren't having that. That was John's choice, and I think he got it right. You know, we said, you know, this is Unix. The C language is the language that Unix is implemented in. We are going to be better using that than using some other tool which is specific to Zilog and is unlikely to port. So we are thinking Unix is a portable operating system. We are going to... Um, increase our chances somewhat if we uh, write this in C. So we wrote the whole lot in C on generally fairly buggy compilers, let alone buggy operating systems. <laughs> A fairly fateful decision. I imagine if you'd written on the Zilog um, language, you, uh, the, the interpreter would have run faster. Mm. Pro probably, probably yeah. yeah. And we wouldn't be here today. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it might have run faster, I have my doubts. <laughs> so your choice of, the, um, of writing the interpreter in C made possible the future of the whole interpreter. Didn't guarantee it, yeah. of course, you said. You eventually got the interpreter finished for Zilog? Finished. Yes. <laughs> it's still nearly finished. <laughs> how, how did that do? Uh, did we sell any? We sold, well, I remember giving a course to the Swedish Civil Defence Organisation with their brand new Zilog 8000 um, machine. So we sold a couple, yeah. Mm. Um, but we, as uh, Peter Donnelly was fond of saying, we, we were trying to sell people a strange language that they'd never heard of on a strange machine they'd never heard of under a strange operating system that they'd never heard of. So it was a triple whammy. It, it was hard work mm. to do that. Yeah. And in those days, the, the sport was every time two men and a dog had a couple of hundred dollars to spare, they would invent a new Unix machine. Um, and uh, so we, we spent a lot, and all the Unix machines had a little box saying APL that needed a tick in it. So we were conned into, uh, if you port to this, the Bleasdale B500, what was it? The, the yeah, was Altos, bloody bloody, the... White Chapels? White Chapels. <laughs> you know, you'll become very rich. And a lot of these uh, machines, uh, the, a lot of these companies survive long enough for us to complete the port before <laughs> going, uh, <laughs> going belly up. And for the first um, 10 years of this porting, we never found a C compiler without finding bugs in it. So the porting work was to 
we'd write a C expression which didn't give the result it was supposed to, this deep in the interpreter, so it was all about debugging the C compilers and uh, don't even mention optimizers. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, that I found out, Jeff, we were talking about this the other day, I found out very soul-destroying, hard, mental health-threatening work. Um, Jeff is of built of different stuff from me. So. Yeah, no, I, quite, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I quote, for this, I'm holding here the um, history of dialogue that was written for its 25th anniversary. <coughs> and uh, these are John's words, and that is what Jeff and I did. It was horrible work. One of my memories is being locked in a basement in Paris with a Honeywell bull. The correct description is a nasty cellar with a nasty piece of software on a nasty machine until we got it done. There was a lot of that. It was quite stressful work. I think they promised us this was the last port you'll ever <laughs> have to do. <coughs> After this, you'll be able to do some development. That was a low point. And then you got arrested. <laughs> yeah, I got arrested. <laughs> Tell uh, us about the arrest. <laughs> um, we were going to Paris. Uh, and Dave Gordon, who was one of our guys, uh, flew to Paris with one tape and some floppy disks and things ready to do this port. And I took my motorcycle over because I was going to go down to Le Mans for the 24-hour race afterwards. And um, I sort of came off the ferry and drove off the ferry. That was all fine. Just down the road, they pulled me over. I opened the panniers. And there's two real, real tapes, some floppy disks. And they sort of go, what do you got there? <laughs> so they carted me off to the police station. And I'm trying to remember the schoolboy French. And I got thrown off of French at school. So <laughs> my French is pretty well non-existent. And uh, the thing they were most worried about was I said, this box of 10 three and a half inch floppy disks, which were brand new at the time, was 40 pounds worth. And this reel-to-reel -reel tape, looks much bigger, was only four pounds worth. And they wouldn't believe this. <laughs> but, and, and of course, by that time, Dave Gordon had got to Paris, so all our source that was sitting on this reel-to-reel -reel tape was worth nothing. So anyway, they eventually let me go, so that was, that was OK. <laughs> So I think you've said that was the uh, only time you've been arrested for non-political reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the only time I've been arrested, but <laughs> I've been on a few demos. <laughs> As a story that I think it was Dave Crosley used to say, his mnemonic for remembering the direction of rotate was based on your politics. Do you know this story? Yep, yeah, I know that. A left shift is a positive shift. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a number of ports. You turned up, I think, to show what you got in Washington for APL 83, mm -hmm. where there were a number of these two men and a dog Unix machines. Uh, I think we turned up with a Zilog and a Gould. Cool. Um, and the gold was dropped off the back of the lorry when it got to Washington. <laughs> so it was a rather bent gold. <laughs> Could you start it? Uh, yeah, it, it, it ran. <clears throat> and um, there are a couple of machines that made a difference to our development because they gave us shocks early on. The gold was the first machine we came across. That was our first 32-bit port. Mm. That bit was straightforward but it wanted everything aligned on natural boundaries. And that was new to us. Hmm. Um, so all of our double, I mean, everything else was word aligned naturally from the way we sort of organized the memory, but double precision floating points weren't. So at that point, we had to work out how to make sure that we kept the alignment during, as we moved everything around in the workspace. Hmm. And the other one that caused us grief like that was the ICL PERC, which is uh, ICL's badge version of a Three Rivers PERC, which was the first bitmap screen GUI implementation uh, device that we came across. These, the guys at uh, PERC 
um, had seen Xerox's work on the original sort of mouse wimp, wimp interface stuff. And uh, so they built, they got this ICL perk. But the interesting thing about that is you've got pointers into words. If you want a pointer to a character, it took two more bytes. So you've got four byte pointers to words and six byte pointers to characters. That was interesting. Well, you must have been getting a fair bit of experience of doing ports now and being locked into basements. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, meantime, the consulting business for Dyadic was getting, I think, more difficult. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, PCs must have been starting to make an impact on that as people took uh, time-sharing systems and converted them to VisiCalc and early PCs. It, w it was getting harder than before the PC came out. Uh, PC, I think, came in 1984. Anyone want to say, disagree with that? I think 1984 for the PC. Um, the thing that had come out slightly earlier than that with VisiCalc was the Apple II. Um, and that was making some impact on that sort of market. But I don't think it was enormous. I think it was just the economics. I don't think, I mean... I'm not going to blame it on Margaret Thatcher, but it might, <laughs> might have been. <laughs> but uh, s certainly Dyadic was having some difficulties and was rescued then by a company called Linwood. That's correct. Yeah, yes. what was that yeah. like from, what do you see? Lin Linwood had an interest because they actually manufactured um, terminals, mm. screen type terminals, and they had manufactured APL terminals. So they knew about us from that perspective. But the real interest from their point of view is these terminals had Z8000 chips in them. Mm -hmm. And they thought, mm, maybe if we take over this company, we can get some Z8000 assembler programs that programmers out of it. They missed the loyalty to APL. <laughs> and uh, they never got that out of us. So we, we persisted with the APL don't think it ever made Linwood any money. Um, so it was sort of interesting, you know. Uh, so they had ambitions for, for you two, but you wouldn't play, you wouldn't leave the APL alone. It, it was a very tight team, I think, and we were kind of, in the end, we wound up in a little hut in the garden of Linwood, and um, they kind of ignored us a bit. Uh, <coughs> But we, we persisted with the API. I, I've got a feeling they, they wanted to get into the Unix machine. Were they going to make it the Unix machine? or was that they, did make a, <coughs> they did get into the Unix machine mm. market, and they took Dave Gordon. Oh, yeah. So <coughs> we lost Dave Gordon to that particular thing because he wanted to get into the Unix side of it, which was fine. <coughs> so a bit of a stalemate. They wanted you to leave the APL alone mm. and work on Unix things for them, and you're keeping the band together. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Uh, how did that resolve? How did the stalemate end? Uh, well, we <coughs> we bought ourselves out from underneath the uh, the, the Limwood organisation. So <coughs> um, Peter Donnelly, Pauline Brand, and I put our houses on the line to borrow money to uh, invest into a software venture that had never made any money. <laughs> <clears throat> it was a crazy thing to do. It was, it was a stupid thing to do. Um, and uh, they, they and then uh, formed the, the company, effectively bought ourselves and became independent again. Um, and then we moved uh, to um, offices near Basingstoke, which was the centre of gravity of where everyone lived. So that's how we've wound up in, in that area. Well, respect. Second, respect. <laughs> well, it's stupid, but we were young and foolish. So. Can you remember what you were thinking? We weren't. I don't think we were thinking. <laughs> we, were not, uh, <coughs> we, we were thinking about dyadic transposes and uh, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Okay. But you did get a, another porting customer, I think, associated with the SimCorp application. Yes. Yes. Do you? This, this is more Pete Donnelly's area than, than ours, but what actually happened, SimCorp, Pete managed to sell SimCorp Dialog APL, and they were selling a system for 
um, building societies to manage their assets and such like. And sort of every UK building society had different hardware. So we wound up doing lots of ports for different hardware for UK building societies, which was fine, you know, so I quite enjoyed porting. <laughs> <laughs> So that puts you in Basingstoke, and while you'd originally started with uh, a year to get a working APL interpreter, which um, is arguably very fast and didn't give you any time to optimize algorithms, mm -hmm. you'd now done enough ports and had enough experience, the interpreter must have had a chance to mature. Yep. This time. I'm, I'm yep. imagining by this time the interpreter's a lot better than the first, the first time you ported it. What did you been able to do? Um, we did quite a lot of work. I kept getting hammered for work on dyadic iota, and uh, we still get hammered for work on dyadic iota. <laughs> it seems to be the thing that drives most people's applications. Um, I went to uh, a company in Holland, OCE, and they were running, uh, they were testing algorithms for photocopiers. And uh, they were running for absolutely hours on Boolean matrices, uh, doing manipulations on Boolean matrices. And they, did, they, they didn't worry that they were running for hours because all they were doing was testing algorithms. But I came back from that visit and uh, promptly sped up a whole load of Boolean <laughs> algorithm stuff that was going on so that I was then doing it 32 bits at a chunk. Um, and I'd still like to do it 32 or 64 bits at a chunk. But one of the things that sort of came up from uh, the thing yesterday is we store bits uh, big endian in bytes. So the first bit is the leftmost bit in the byte. And for a big endian machine, that just means it naturally extends to 32 bits and 64 bits if you've got 64 bit registers. All of that stuff just works. For a little endian machine, like this strange Intel thing, <laughs> doesn't work quite so well. Um, and uh, you have to play sort of funny tricks, you know, you sort of load the thing, swap all the bytes around in the byte, and, and, the, and then work from there. Um, and I sort of wish that for little endian machines, we'd stored the bits the other way around in the byte for that machine, and we've never done that. So that, that's a potential change. So these, these early years were precarious. The, pro the business was living hand to mouth. The interpreter was living from port to port, getting a little bit, little bit better each time. I found what you had to say about investing in the, in the <coughs> company at that time. And I'd like to share it. Oh, good. We bet, we bet our houses on a business we didn't think would last a year. Why would we do that? I don't know. <laughs> no, I do know really. It was, what else do you do? It was a strange decision. Linwood was going nowhere. From my personal point of view, I got a huge psychological investment in this product and it was either take it or leave it. It was like poker. Mm. You pitch your money in or you're out of the game, mate. What poker players call moving all in, it was that. Did we have perhaps a deep down fundamental belief this was something which was going to create a sustainable business? No, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. I still am a techie born and bred. If you slice me through, you'll find techiness there rather than business. I was intellectually committed. I don't do reality very well. <laughs> Just me, yeah. <laughs> so an intellectual, uh, an intellectual idea was enough. Mm. Well, sometimes after, sometime after this, the um, product was ported on to Windows, but stopped being just Unix alone. There must have come a time you must have reached a point at which you started to see the uh, uh, sustainable-looking business at least forming an outline 
around this? When did, when did it start to look like actually this might work? I'd, I'd like to say, first of all, it was Pete Donnelly who said, you've got to do a, well, no, DOS version. DOS version was yeah. the first. You've got to do a, yeah, 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 we, we don't like DOS, we prefer Unix. And eventually he, uh, encouraged is a good word, us to do, um, to do a DOS port, which put us in, a, in the right, at least the right platform for going to Windows. And again, Pete Donnelly had the vision to see this was the, the way to go and, and actually led a lot of the design with young, uh, what's his name over there? <coughs> John Daintree. Um, but that's kind of, then we're moving beyond the early days. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that the DOS port was a good, a good thing to do, and then that took us into uh, Windows. We, we had this thing about these IBM PCs around, and most of them were running 286 chips at the time. Um, and the 286 chip is horrible. <laughs> I think any of the techies here will say the 286 chip is horrible. Um, but what there was, was there was a board produced by a company called Opus, which um, slotted into the PC and would run a NAT Semi 3216 or 3232 chip on it. And, that ra and they supplied a Unix to go with that. Um, so we tried that for a bit. We put up, we did a port to the Opus, um, quite a nice chip, 3232, and uh, developed that. Um, didn't sell very many of them, I might say. But then came the 386. And the 386 made an enormous difference. We could target that, both for Unix and for DOS. Um, and there was, I think it was an XSTSC guy, the guy who did uh, the APL Win product, went off and did Farlap which was oh, a way of running... Um, this, this, is the, this is the file app guy. No. No. Richard Smith. Richard Smith, okay. Richard Smith. Richard Smith. And I think he was XSTSC, wasn't he? <coughs> yeah. 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 And he, he wrote file app, which allowed us to run proper 32-bit programs on a 386 under DOS. And there was a, guy, and there was a bunch, uh, a MetaWare high c came out and came, came with a gospel of Mark <laughs> in the box, <laughs> which Pauline was quite impressed by, which I was surprised at. But it, came, uh, it, it sort of made a statement about the guys who were producing that product. Um, and so the Metaware High c came along with the file app and suddenly we had a product we could ship that would run on 386 boxes. And at the same time, from a sort of software point of view, we did the Quad SM, Quad SR stuff, which is how you write green screen applications. The other thing we got hit by at that stage is I went out to um, an APL standards meeting in Asilima, and I got hit on by a bunch of IBM suits um, because they wanted to get rid of the underscored alphabet out of APL. Uh, because they couldn't fit it on the EEPROM on the board of a PC. You know, nothing like looking to the future. <laughs> so there were two of us at Asilima. The, there was um, Michael Berry, who was doing, a, who was doing APL on a, a parallel processing machine, and myself, who thought, you know, why are you worried about this? <laughs> and uh, everybody else just trod on us, and uh, the underscored alphabet was taken out of the APL standard at that point. These would be about Dialog's early years, a story of contingency, of accident, which we never expected, well, we certainly never expected, would lead into a sustainable and flourishing mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. in the next century. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. yeah. absolutely. Yes. All right, well, please thank my guests. <laughs>